Hello, we are live. Matt's watching an advertisement, but the rest of us are watching our game uh, that we're playing tonight as we're playing and continuing our Alien Cinders of Heaven campaign. Um, we're starting a brand new chapter tonight, so if you've never joined us before and this is your first time here, if we've got brand new people in the in the chat, thanks for joining us. You don't need to know anything that happened in the chapter one. This is like a completely different crew, completely different story, parallel universe, all that kind of stuff, but like... No, you're all good. And if you're and if you're watching this later on on YouTube, thanks for watching this. And if you like what you see here, go back and watch like episodes one to twelve because that's the whole different chapter. So, uh, but yeah, we're gonna do something brand new. Uh, same crew, like meeting the same people, but everyone's playing different characters with one slight wrinkle that we'll we'll cover. Uh, we also have a couple new rules that we're gonna do, uh, especially for uh, for bits. Uh, we're gonna we're kind of changing the way we're doing bits slightly. Uh, so as opposed to doing re-rolls, we're going to do stress healing instead. So if you feel like getting involved, you don't have to. You're just welcome to just kind of hang out and just watch and whatever. But if you feel like throwing some bits and helping out the players from time to time, 100 bits will actually help them with a stress heal. Uh, stress went pretty crazy last time uh, where people were, were – yeah, it was it was as fun as you would yeah. expect it to be. Um, it spiraled. Within, within limits, of course. And if you want to, like, screw over the players like I do uh, and you want to be my friend, uh, then you can throw out a couple hundred bits, 500 bits, and then I will add a complication like a extra alien that may or may not kill one of the players. Uh, never mind. We're not going to talk about that. Or more than one. Or more than one. Or more than one. So, yeah. Anyway. It worked last time. It did. It did, it did work last time. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just kind of do introductions then for everybody. Um you can mention, I mean, just mention like your character and, you know, what class you pick. But in terms of like describing them, we'll probably just, I got like, we'll do like a little opening thing and like describe each of them and like in, 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 you know, in the middle of some kind of activity. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be that. And then plug whatever you got that you want to plug. So we'll start just the way it's laid out on the screen. And Jeremy, you're up first. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm going to be playing a completely new character by the name of Chet. He's an obnoxious little kid. Nothing special about him, other than we already know he's synthetic and he's a little bastard. But uh, you know, good times. New chat. Spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, but the same, right? Like kind of like yeah. Walter and David. Was it Walter? And I think it was Walter and David. Yeah. Like the, the the Prometheus and 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 Covenant kind of like same. Looks the same built on the same code but slightly different in some in some respects so it's gonna yeah we're gonna have a little fun with that uh and you got a you got a podcast i hear is that true it's true matt and our buddy ken uh we sometimes talk about comics on plutecast plewd uh it'd be good times we're hoping to start some new stuff with invincibles as that premieres this weekend yes. right we're gonna do we're gonna do weekly episodes we're gonna review each episode of invincible as it happens I'm very not real time for this but every week that's we're awesome. gonna do little short mini episodes so we'll find us on the plutecast and we're gonna throw on the plutecast youtube channel as well we're gonna take advantage of that hype Woo. yeah should be fun i'm very excited to listen to that i really enjoyed invincible it was i didn't think i would and i did i very much enjoyed it, it was same fantastic same. yeah yeah same awesome uh, One of the right. best comics I've read in the last ten years. Hey Sorry. Tombstone, thank you for uh, thank you for subbing it, and uh, thanks for hanging out tonight. It's good to see you again. Uh, and let's move over to Adam. Hello, I'm Adam. I'm playing Austin Rook Winters, and uh, he'll be the captain of this ship. Uh, as we learned from last session, being captain sucks, but somebody's got to do it. So it's true. Uh, we'll we'll see how yeah. we'll see how this goes and um, if I can last more than a few sessions. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, other than that, uh, we I'd like to uh, go ahead and promote uh, the website, like uh, Nightbot just did. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, um, yeah, we'll uh, just check us out. You'll be seeing news. I'm totally drawing a blank. Because I'm awesome. It's great. So just go there. Do things. Click. Uh, I understand the drawing a blank thing very much. It's going to happen in about ooh, seven or eight minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. I hear you. Uh, okay. Keep it over. Uh, keep going over to Melissa. Uh, Melissa with Adventures in Lollygagging. Um, in terms of plugs, you can catch us here every other Monday with this alien campaign. On Fridays, uh, we just started up a Delta Green campaign, yeah. um, so we're excited to get that moving along. And then on every other Mondays when we're not here, you can catch us on Free League Publishing. Uh, we just started up some things from the flood. 
Yeah. A little bit about me. Um, so I am playing Jocelyn Jaws Hilliard. I'm going to be the pilot. I hear that's a good way to get promotions. Maybe. I don't know if you want promotions in this universe. Yeah. Just want to <laughs> just, just keep keep under the radar as long as you can, as best you can. Uh, okay. All right. Very nice. Uh, and then let's go to the bottom row, Jen. Hey, everybody. I am playing Erica Bone Stewart tonight. She is a scientist slash researcher. And uh, yeah, I'm with the uh, Grim and Perilous group. And I do streaming on my Twitch channel, Pixel Prowler. So stop by, say hi. Follows are appreciated. Yeah. And links right there in the chat. Thank you all. Uh, and to Matt. Sorry, I'm just replying to uh, Ashley. Ashley, Ken, Ken, like Jeremy said, Ken's our anime manga guy. May he's trying to talk us into doing some anime. We'll see. Maybe for you, we'll do some anime or ma manga. Manga. Um, all right. Hey, I'm Matt. I'm playing a new character. I'm playing Sergeant Denny Hobart, who is a colonial marine on this rig. And uh, what do I got going on this week? Well, you can find me on Garb Light Games tomorrow, along with Jeff. We are doing the Pulp Cthulhu Masks of Nyarlathotep uh, campaign. We are going to wrap up Peru tomorrow afternoon, and that is at, oh, Daylight Savings. Uh, it's 21.30 Greenwich Mean Time. 21.30 Greenwich Mean Time. Just 3.30. 3.30 Central? I think it's 3.30. No, 4.30 4 Central Standard Time. It's 3.30 for me. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's uh, right. I think that's right. I think you're right. Okay, I'm Pacific now. I'm Pacific now. That's right. Yes. 4.30 Central Standard Time, 21.30 GMT. You can catch Jeff and myself over on Garb Light Games. You can also find me over on Free League Publishing. I'm running Forbidden Lands this Thursday, sometime during the day because of uh, daylight savings. I don't know. You can find me on Thursday running Forbidden Lands, Bitter Reach, Forbidden Lands on Sunday nights, and also be running Alien uh, at GaryCon this Saturday at 12 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time uh, as for Free League, running Alien, and then I'll be interviewing Andrew Gaska, the author of the Alien um, RPG books on there. Awesome. Can you uh, can you ask him a question for me, yep. Matt? Can yes. you can you ask him what the various designations for planets mean? Like the LV, sure. KG, G? I can't find Just that remind information. Me afterwards. Yeah. Drop in the chat and I'll, I'll ask him. Because I, I, I did some looking into LV, and there's a lot of people with different theories. Some people say it's, like, short for Leviticus, and some people say it's, like, uh, it's like life viable, but there's no, like... I'm, I've always been curious. Anyway, yeah. Cool. Yep. See if, see if he knows. Uh, and then, last but not least, the doctor is in. It's Chuck. Hey, I'm Chuck. Um, find me at Defenders of Cobalt. We do stuff and things there, you know stuff things uh and i'm playing dr buckland one of the two scientists uh and i'm gonna science some shit out of stuff there we go well that's what we're here to do yeah Definitely. All science. sorry I'm i could not so remember much science for the life of me what i put for the garp like uh, to the mass and the third one i got it. it's like garp like <laughs> no nope, i don't think that's right but, but, ah, there we go i figured it out Okay, awesome. Uh, so let's get going. So I gave everybody an op, like they had their, I gave them a couple ideas, throw a couple different uh, ideas for how you would run a parallel game. Because this is going to be kind of parallel overlapping timelines in the same general region of space, frontier area, because that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, I gave them a couple different options on what we wanted our next crew to focus on. And they like the idea of corporate scientists. Uh, and so that's what we're doing. We are all going to, like, not everybody here is a scientist, but we're serving on a science vessel and doing stuff. Um, which means that they're all ethically questionable, uh, morally challenged people, probably. Um, especially, you know anybody here who's a scientist uh and uh yeah that's how we're gonna go um everyone works for Wayland yutani in one form or another uh, whether it's for security whether it's as a synth whether it's as just some kind of you know a pilot or whatever or whether you are employed uh in the science division uh, so that's that's something to keep in mind and uh in terms of the exact timeline don't worry about it too much since there's so much in terms of like uh hype you know hyperspace travel that makes it so that 
time moves a little 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 wonky here and there but basically this is a parallel story completely different place but if you paid attention maybe there's going to be little little couple nuggets here and there and cameos and stuff from time to time uh so let's get started let me set the mood with a little music if i can find it let's see get a little get a little of that a little nostromo music going what i'm half what no, 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 no. This okay. is what happens. <laughs> Chat <laughs> takes a life of its own, and you have a new name. Oh, boy. Okay. AKA Hefe. Okay. <laughs> that's been around for a while. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes, you are, Ashley. You just wait till Friday. Watch what happens to you. It's going to be even worse than that. There are worse things than death when it comes to Delta Green. But we're not playing Delta Green. We're playing Alien, so let's play Alien. All right, here we go. We're starting all semantic like space it's quiet up onto the screen comes this massive gas giant looming in the distance all these moons countless perhaps moons start to orbit this thing but it's almost invisible at this distance and especially in contrast to how big this giant is we see this retrofitted science vessel suddenly peer into the screen coming right to the left you can see it's got those awkward towers that's so synonymous with with alien vessels uh, a lot of them are patched though and you can see that there's some fancy extra modules and additions certain vehicle bays and cargo bays have been extended uh, or expanded in some places you see a fancy looking uh, uh, eev vehicle sitting right on top uh, of the ship as well and not those old school escape pods uh, we see all sorts of wonderful things. And as we're passing by, we hear this little blip. All right. Not a very high-pitched blip or a, or a tingy blip or anything like that. Just like this dull and muted blip. And it happens like over and over and over again until finally the camera shifts inside the ship. We go past a thrumming and functional FTL engine in, in radiator, or not radiator, reactor core. Uh, we see cargo bays that are filled with ATVs, electrical fence wiring, this modified drop ship that looks to have been retrofitted in some way by the company, and these very long, almost ten, about 10 foot long, white specimen boxes. We also see numerous lightless labs, we see experiments that have been left untended. Uh, that are just kind of going through the constant cycle as we're in hyperspace. But still we hear that dull blip over and over and over again. But now it sort of becomes a double blip. It's like ba bump ba bumch ba bumch almost like a heartbeat. And we keep moving until finally we see a long and dark corridor, except for the very last few feet at the far end, at a distance, where it's lit up because of the motion sensor, we see a kid throwing a rubber ball down into the floor, bounces off the floor at a particular angle into the wall, arcs perfectly over and back towards his hand, which he catches in the exact position every time, throws it again, ba -boom -tsh, ba -boom -tsh. and over and over we see this for like five, six, seven times until finally, there is an imperceptible change to the angle with which the ball hits the ground, which slightly changes the wall. And then as it comes and hits his hand, it misses and it goes bouncing away down the hallway itself. So what does Chet look like, Jeremy, as he watches this ball strangely like roll away from him? Huh. Uh, Chet is probably around 12, 13. Um, tall for what you would expect for a kid that age, kind of like lean and um, lanky, basically. Um, wears impeccably nice clothing that seems odd for a kid, like almost uniform style and like hair that's been tussled and coiffed in the way like somebody who, it looks like you spent half an hour to make your head look like you didn't brush. He just looks like a little bastard. Yeah. Like, just kind of like a little smarmy grin on his face more often than not. And as you watch, like, the ball just rolls right down the middle of the hallway. 
And with the ball rolling down the hallway, like motion sensor lights just pop on one at a time. And you're just watching this. As you go to stand up to go retrieve it, again, inexplicably, you stumble. Like your foot just kind of lands awkwardly and it kind of almost rolls your ankle. You have to brace yourself against the wall briefly or else you were going to do a face plant right into the floor. But you're able to steady yourself. You're able to get up. You walk down the hallway towards the ball. And the ball comes to a stop against a door that says hypersleep chambers. And that's when right as the ball hits it, it opens up. Uh, and we see a couple people who are in the process of like putting clothes on, putting coveralls, jackets, and stuff on. Uh, they look, uh, they look the military type. Matt, what does your character look like? What does Sergeant Hobart look like? Sergeant Hobart, he's uh, an older gentleman. He's kind of in his twilight years of service. He's got uh, the short brush cut, but he's it's uh, salt and pepper, gray hair. Uh, he's got like a, a kindly looking face. He's more of a you look at him in disposition, or looks kind of like a like a grandfather type. Um, the the years in the Marine Corps have taken its toll on on him. And you can definitely see it in his face. Okay. And as Ashley says, he's only three weeks from retirement. So he is. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> there you go. So uh, you have just gotten out of hypersleep. Feel hungry, but you've been in and out of hypersleep plenty of times in your life. You've got stuff to do. You have a job to do. You don't know exactly the details of the job yet. Briefing is coming, and you've got one of your security aides next to you. What's the first thing that Sergeant Hobart would do uh, when he gets out of hypersleep? It's like one of the first things he would go do. Uh, one of the first things he'd do is he would get a status report from Chet. Because Chet is the one who was watching the ship, right, while we were, yeah. while we were out? Yeah. And lo and behold, there is Chet right in the middle of the hall. Uh, and the ball is just like rolling past Ho Hobart. Didn't even see it. Just rolls into the hyperspace ch hyperspace chamber. And there's Chet standing right in the middle of the hallway, looking confused. What's uh, going on there, Chet? Everything is just peachy keen, sir. I need a full report. Sir, yes, sir. Um, so I was able to bounce the ball successfully for about 327 rotations. The 328th was unsuccessful, and I'm a little confused. The ship is fine. Where are we at? We are at... Yeah, and you can fake coordinates. Uh, it's, an, it's an uncharted system, not yet on commercial charts. You... You both would know. It was probably mentioned to you in the the pre hypersleep briefing that this is uh, you're going to a system that is not yet officially claimed, and that there is apparently a dispute between both Wayland Utani and uh, and LaSalle Bionational in terms of who actually gets claiming rights of this. Um, that's the extent of what you understand, but you know that the captain would probably have more details. Uh, when the time comes, you would also know, Chet, that you've been a, you've been under for about three weeks. It's been twenty days specifically. You've had no issues whatsoever. Uh, everything's running ship shape, perfect. No issues that you can report whatsoever. So the ball continues to go, and we're gonna follow it as we go into that hyperspace hypersleep chamber, where you can see there's about a seven or eight other people in here that are in various stages of undress, some of whom are sitting up and just kind of sit, like leaning over and vomiting into buckets as they just woke up from hypersleep. We see a few other folks that are uh, in the, the showers, like off in the distance, that are just kind of, kind of cleaning off the, the three-week junk that has piled up on them. And we see two figures uh, that are by lockers here. Uh, couple away from each other they're both kind of getting you know getting their clothes on their their kind of coveralls with their names we see one of the lockers uh has the name uh buckland on it so chuck what does dr buckland look like and what's in his locker oh uh so yeah dr buckland is you know late 40s salt and pepper unkempt shaggy hair 
Uh, he has a beard, but not because he's growing a beard. More so as he's just been too preoccupied to, you know, shave. So it's just scraggly. Um, his locker is probably just a complete and total mess. Uh, papers just jammed in there. Uh, he tends to wear one lab coat until it looks dirtier than the previous lab coat. And then he'll put the other one back on. He is, uh, you know, he's a messy guy. Okay. And then the other locker we see uh, says Stuart on it. So, Jen, what is Dr. Bones? I'm not sure how she goes, what she goes by, but what does she look like? And same question. I'm just kind of curious about people's lockers. Uh, she's a bit on the short side. She's about 5'3", and it has like a muscular build. Um, she has sh short, dark hair and discerning green eyes. Um, she's wearing a army green tank top and some loose khaki pants. Um, you see a set of tools around her hip on a belt. And in her locker is a picture of a older gentleman that's her grandfather. Okay. And he's like next to a... Uh, a dick site with uh, a bone in his hands. Nice. Would we say, bo are you going, is bones anthropology or archaeology? Or? Archaeology. Okay, perfect. So as the two of you are getting ready, we hear a voice come over on the ship intercom, and it's just broadcast across the whole ship. And it's kind of fuzzy, so it doesn't quite sound like your captain's voice, but you know it's him, and it just says... Galley, 20 minutes, mission debrief. And then the camera abruptly shifts, and we see Rook sitting on the bridge, having just turned the intercom off. So, Adam, what does Rook look like? Well, right now you can see a man wearing basically the, the undergarments that would have he would have been in in hypersleep. Uh and just a robe over that as he's uh, sitting on the bridge and he like lifts, lifts up this uh, metal uh, coffee cup and uh, is just drinking out of it as uh, it was obvious that the f his first priority was getting to the coffee. Okay. Um, he just threw on a robe and, and got to that. And then he presses a button on the intercom and he says, yeah, Chet, thanks for getting the coffee ready as always. What color robe? Uh, Jen, Jen, Jen wants to know. Inquiring minds. Um, Let's do like a real light tan beige. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So Love up it. on... Yeah, she nailed it. She said that it sounds like a beige now before you started saying that. Uh, okay. So I went ahead and opened up a document for you, uh, Adam. If you want to look in the journal entries under player notes, chapter two, there'll be an operational assignment. You can read that. Everyone can see it in a second, but you can start with it now if you want. Because also on the ship, we see somebody sitting in the pilot chair. Uh, so what does this person look like, Melissa? What does the pilot station in general look like? Uh, so you see that everything is uh, very kind of neatly organized, um, but the thing that sort of sticks out um, is that uh, Jaws has uh, one of those dashboard bobbleheads, um, and it is basically a kind of shark coming up, and you just see two feet sticking out of the mouth of the shark, um, and at the little bottom of it says, be the shark. Um, <laughs> I like it. It's really good. Uh, nice. And did you describe physically, like, what, what are we looking at when we see, what's, what, what are our eyes drawn to when it comes to your character? Uh, so she is definitely tall. Okay. She's, you know, kind of in the, you know, kind of 5'9", kind of 5'8", five, 5'9", five, um, height, uh, brunette, brown eyes. Um, her hair looks like she's sort of spent time to kind of get it where she wants it to be. Um, and... She's sort of kind of flight suit kind of half up so that you, you can kind of see under, you know, she's got kind of the, the tank on and you can see on her arms and areas that would normally be covered if she's wearing like a t-shirt or uh, her flight suit that she's got multiple tattoos. Um, so one of them looks like a squad symbol and it's got some initials and she's got some other various kind of initials okay. and figures and things. And you're going through the various uh, 
you know, the various uh, consoles uh, at the at the piloting station. Everything's on track. Engines are thrumming beautifully, efficiently. Not a care in the world. Uh, no issues whatsoever. The, the, the kid made sure everything was up, up and up and ready. Now, over the next 15, 20 minutes, everyone starts to move towards the galley, which is much bigger uh, than we remember on our Khalidi Sinem, which was just a tiny little, like, tiny little kitchen, you know, big enough for maybe three or four people. This place is much bigger. It probably can actually fit maybe twice your number. There's 12 total people, including, including Chet, synthetic, on the ship. And one by one, all of you make it there. Chet, you open a door at one point on your way to the galley, and you're you think you're going to the galley. You're in, you had every intention to go into the galley, but when you hit the little button on the side of the, the wall, the door opens up, and you come face to face with the bathroom. Make sure nobody's seeing me make this mistake and just close it and try to nonchalantly go back the way I'm supposed to go. Okay. And you're able to really quickly just look at some of the signs, etc., and you make your way back. So after about 20 minutes, everyone's now in the, uh, in the galley and I'll go ahead and share with everybody at this point, the full kind of, operational assignment that you have. Uh, Adam, you're welcome to read it if you like, or, or kind of summarize it as best you like, as you're the one who's kind of giving this information to everybody in the crew. All right, folks here, listen up. So we've got, uh, finally got our assignment. You know how Waylon likes to do. Uh, they like to make sure that we don't know until we need to know. So looks like we're going to be heading down here because one of our survey teams discovered some sort of anomaly, some sort of radiation signals, um, some weird vegetation patterns, if that means anything to you two, as he looks at uh, Jaws and, um, or not Jaws, at uh, Bones and uh, Dr. Buckland. Uh, you know, we just need to determine its origin. Um, biggest reason we want to do that is we want to get down there and see if it's something that's going to be worth anything because good old our friends over at the sal bio national they they filed a claim dispute and, well if i were gonna venture a guess i'd say that uh whaling yutani wants to figure out whether or not we want to fight this claim or just let them have it so we can't be dawdling about Flora and fauna. That's interesting. Um, any additional information on the uh, abnormalities on the flora and fauna? No, I figure any of those questions would actually be with one of their uh, survey, one of their survey team leads, uh, name of Laura Foster. Um, okay. but, Do we know uh, what kind of star system we're looking at? I mean, we're at, I know the name of a moon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a G987F, you know, because, you know, that means so much to all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's, what sort of atmosphere are we expecting? Information is I don't not see any. I don't see any information on that. So if you got uh, something to keep you breathing, I want to bring that. I'll uh, walk on over to, to Jaws and I'll hold up a, a flask I just pulled out of a, a random cabinet somewhere as I pour some in my coffee and I hold it up to Jaws. I'll absolutely take a tip off. Appreciate it, good sir. Mm-hmm. So, any other questions I can not answer for you? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I'm sorry. My grandfather always says where there is flora and fauna, there is life. Flora and fauna. That's funny. Wow, that's I, a I appreciate smart that. Lady. I do declare. Oh, is she? <laughs> quite obvious there, Bones. 
Uh, no, that? I've had all of my questions not answered satisfactorily. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I had more, I would tell you, but uh, I just don't. Strange that there's radiation, though. Yeah? Maybe this flora and fauna uh, lives off of it somehow. That would it's be radiation so. is its air, so to speak. Carbon. Mm. Well, maybe you get some sort of a living vibe off of that radiation. You know, keeps grooving on. Yes. You guys are weird. Yes. Well, thank you, Chet. Thank you for uh, your observations. I appreciate it. I'm going to rub Chet's time. hair when he says that. Actually, Son of a everybody bitch. make an observation test as, uh, right before that happens. Uh, and, and Hobart, you can go ahead and take like a plus one with that. Yeah, it would help if I got my character sheet out. <laughs> oh my, I must oh, have wow. something in my yeah. eyes. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Hobart, you don't notice, but Dr. Buckland and who else got it? Uh, the two docs, the two doctors, uh, our, our resident scientist. Um, both of you actually just, whether you want to make any anything of this or not, you notice that Chet is wearing his hair differently than when you went down for hypersleep? It's like parted the opposite way. He actually oh. parted his hair? Holy crap. Or it is parted, I should say. Are you trying um, on a, a new moose or something? No. I don't I don't do anything with my hair. But well, you've she, done something. You've parted the sea, so to speak. I, I don't understand. I oh, look great, just woke kid. up that way. Yes. Yeah, I know I look great. Thanks, Grumps. <laughs> Jaws will pull out a little compact mirror and kind of hold it up and show you kind of what everyone's talking about. And that's when Hobart comes over and ruffles it up right as that's his hair. Yeah. yeah. Boys will be boys. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, walk on over to Matt. Your, your character is Hobart? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll walk over to Hobart and hold out the flask to him, too. Uh, he will decline. All right. Just offering. Appreciate it. And then he'll put Never it on the job. He'll put it in Chet's hands. Jaws will actually or kind of reach back out and be like, uh, "I'll I'll take his." <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I should also note that there, in addition to you all, there are actually other people here. Uh, your crew is much larger uh, than we had in the first chapter. This is a much more. Uh, so there's twelve total people. Um, and you would know everybody. I'm not going to go through and introduce all the NPCs. We'll do that as as needed. But there's several other folks. I will notice that in addition to, to Bones and Dr. Buckland, there are additional scientists. Uh, I will say in addition to Sergeant Hobart, there is one other security professional. Plus, there's others on the ship who do have some kind of military experience uh, here and there. Uh, and uh, there is uh, is a designated like roughneck engineer who is the heavy machinery type. That so all of these people are also here, um, and as as they become relevant to a scene or to a moment, there. But there are other people to to interact with. Uh, but time passes, and eventually you find yourselves uh, about fifteen twenty minutes. Actually, no, excuse me, not fifteen twenty minutes. About. Uh, five, six hours later, um, you find yourselves uh, in orbit uh, near, you know, around this moon that you have been assigned to, G987-F. Uh, and you can see without, you can, you can tell when you were approaching Jaws, looking just at the instruments and the panels uh, of the ship, that there are kind of peculiar gravitational issues that you're dealing with because of this massive uh, this massive gas giant that uh, this moon is. You can also notice uh, just on basic sensor sweeps, not nothing even too. Um, it's basic, it's just rudimentary stuff. There's at least a dozen other moons that are in various orbits around, um, but the one you're specifically going to, uh, you have you have managed to reach it. Um, 
you do a quick couple of scans. So, Jaws, go ahead and give me a comp tech really quick, since you're the one who's most likely to do it. Or if anybody else wants to do it, they can do it as well. Um, if you want to just try to get some answers to this, a few of the questions that you've gotten, uh, you have about, like, the atmosphere and things like that, you can go ahead and roll comp tech if you want to get on sensors or a console and do some scans. Okay. Uh, Dr. Stewart. Bones. Uh, you uh, you definitely notice... I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, the atmosphere itself is toxic, um, you would say. It's not to the point where anyone will, will suffocate or, or suffer any kind of immediate harm, but prolonged exposure, uh, and prolonged could be anywhere 10, 20, 30 minutes maybe, uh, would have kind of lasting damage on the lungs um, and would likely cause sort of comprehension issues they would you probably get disoriented uh before uh, probably falling over um so it's probably a place that you would want to keep your you know keep your your suits on all of which you have there's several suits no problem whatsoever there's there's no limitations uh Weyland yutani has spared no expense um you would also know those of you who have been on missions before hobart rook you would know that it's a pretty standard procedure uh, for an advanced survey team to set up some kind of base camp. Um, it, the way it was, some of the language that was used, Rook, you would know, the, the team that was handling this was likely just a setting up kind of surveying situations, figuring out where various mining equipment when they get through the stri strip mining process. Um, and likely they have already kind of set up camp. Um, but as you, uh, as you start going through some of your, some of the limited amounts of, of like orbital scanning that you can do you do notice that there is no vegetation no signs of life basically anywhere on the moon which does appear to be you know kind of tidally locked it's it's not not rotating um but you do notice that right on kind of the equatorial region um there is one very small very faint uh, radiation signal that's popping out that is differing from anywhere else. You do like a quick kind of couple hour spin around. You notice no other ships in the area. Um, you have, you do, you would know that you have on your ship, you, you do actually have a drop ship. You have a shuttle um, that would take a handful of people down modified from like a like a US CMC drop ship but it's not one of those atmospheric dive bombers but you would more gently go down but your ship is also being a science vessel is rated to do planet fall uh, so you can also take the ship directly down as well um, but you very quickly and easily see exactly the specific the, the specific point where the your operational instructions have sent you like you know you know exactly what they're talking about immediately everywhere else on the planet is just rock Jaws will turn to Rook as the captain. Uh, landing orders, sir? Yeah, well, I'm going to need somebody to land this uh, here vessel. I think I can count on you to do that. Do we want to take her in, or do we want to take the other ship? Uh, probably be good if uh, we took the whole thing, right? Of course, how how easy is it? Uh, what sort of atmosphere we got on this moon? It's quite toxic, uh, very abrasive to the lungs. I recommend we have hazmat suits. I'd be afraid of a uh, maybe there could be some damage to the ship. Should I'm sort of a shuttle type of gal, so to speak. Uh, I mean, it's up to you, Captain. So you're thinking that it'd be a bad idea to take the, the big ship down there and that we should take our little ship down there. Well, I mean, if you want more patches, we could patch it up. All right. Well, then let's, uh, let's get on that shuttle. And we'll take that down there. And I suppose if uh, we need a larger vessel to come down... I mean, surely someone else on this vessel can do that, right? No. Um, 
<laughs> Nobody knows how to fly. No, yeah, yeah. I'm I know how to fly it. <laughs> sure. The shuttle would take, uh, I think, eight. So you have uh, you have up to eight people. Obviously, the six of you, because let's just assume. Um, and then, uh, if you wanted to take anybody else, you could. Uh, but otherwise, you could leave up to f- you know four to six people back on on this ship if if you wanted to keep the uh, the sane, the S A E N, uh, in orbit. Is it assumed that we have enough suits to wear down there also for all of us? Absolutely. Okay. You all are very well stocked. All right. Well, um, we've got a medic, right? You do indeed. Yeah. Not suppose, one of us. Not one of someone. you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I suppose we should grab the medic in case uh, any of us trips and falls and, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, I can fly this thing down and, you know, take care of it, but you make those decisions, not me. Well, I can fly anything Cap- anywhere. Cap- Captain, I recommend we do not take the ship down there. We do not know what is waiting for us. I would agree. I would hate to have the gravity of the ship mess up some of my macro gravity experimentations I have. Well, that's kind of you to give me that sort of advisement. What do you think, Joss? That's fine. I'll leave it safe out here where nothing bad can happen all right we'll take, take the shuttle, shuttle. Right down. Mm-hmm. okay yeah, all right i'll just ignore you that's so harsh well mm. you know this group likes to live safe and you know it's fine it'll be a fun shuttle ride it's protocol <laughs> So All right. Well, I should also you know, um, I should also note, by the way, uh, that there's you do also have ATVs. Like you specifically have four ATVs that can uh, that can each carry two people. Uh, it's like they're old school stuff, but they're still functional and they're good. Uh, like those tractors or whatever. They're not the tractors. No, these are okay. the Wayland NR9 series ATV. Uh, but you have four of them, so like you're they're like they're really fancy golf carts. Um, but, like uh, what was in the extended cut of Aliens? Yeah, I, I cool. think that's them. Yeah. Okay. Um, however, you probably wouldn't be, be able to get all. You can't get all four of those onto the onto the drop ship. So basically, you have the choice of either taking the ship down, the shuttle, the shuttle down, or you can take the whole ship down and then use the ATV. It's entirely up to you. I just I forgot I forgot to mention that part. At at this point, I feel like I have to agree with Jaws. You know, because. <laughs> Who knows what will happen to the ship that's out here, and clearly I need to drive one of those things. <laughs> All right, could we at least fit one on the shuttle? Fit one of the ATVs on the shuttle? Yeah, I know we can't take both. Uh, I'll say if you don't take any other additional people, so if you if you clear out a couple of the seats and just take the six of you, then you could probably fit a single ATV on the, on the I'll Jeff sit in somebody's he... lap if it lets us fit that thing in. <laughs> Jeff's trying to ditch our medic. He doesn't want to. No, you can bring the medic. It's fine. I just wanted to give you These a are choice. The choices we make. Just wanted you to make a choice. That's all. I think, it'd be, I think it'd be pretty useful to have that ATV. Would it be a weight issue? Can't we just put the medic in the little cart? Just push him out the back of the ship and catch him when we get down there. Draws is slowly ATVs outside the ship, ship, not in the ship, down a little bit. So if anyone's paying attention, you'll notice that the the ship is just sort of starting to descend while everyone is just chatting away. And I'm just sort of doing it slow and just seeing if anybody's. Does anybody know? I don't okay. think anyone would, would notice immediately because, like, it, like entry would take a little time. But if this conversation is going on for like fifteen, twenty minutes, yeah, I think after about I'm ten just... minutes, you all are going to start noticing. Yeah, uh, Rook looks over at you and he says, "Well, I think we're decided." Okay. Is that a cloud? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, piloting test. Shit. <laughs> oh, Melissa's going to blow up the ship. It's going to blow up the ship. It's, it's possible, <laughs> as we learned last time. We'll it's start t- chapter three next week. Okay. 
One success. You got six chapter three of me. Oh, 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 oh. oh goodness. Okay. Oh, yes. Man. Oh man. It is. Uh, it? it is a little bumpy. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of turbulence on the way down. Um, but you you don't. Yeah, you don't suffer. You don't seem to suffer any major damage. Um, but it is a little rocky, and that because people didn't necessarily know that they were actually uh, going into Atmo, not everybody was ready. Uh, and so you get a lot of people who get on the intercoms who are cursing uh, that pain in the ass pilot of ours who's going to get us all killed. And uh, so some of you are bouncing around on the walls, falling down, couldn't quite strap down in time, that kind of thing. Um, but eventually you are able to get into uh, into atmosphere under cloud. Uh, and uh, where do you want to go? Well... Now that the ATVs are an option, why don't we land a few clicks outside and go for a ride? You know what, Dr. Buckland? For once, I'm inclined to agree with you. There's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh just to give everyone a little bit of backstory, like everyone on the ship would know that if you didn't figure it out already, Rook shows clear favoritism to Jaws. And um, he almost never agrees with Dr. Buckland. Um, <laughs> like uh, there was a time when he was real nice to Dr. Buckland and then, well, Dr. Buckland started asserting a lot of authority and then he, uh -huh. that didn't go over very well with Rook. Mm -hmm. It's not going to stop anytime soon either. Uh, as, my, <laughs> as my buddy and rival are locked in now. <laughs> mm. There you go. Uh, okay. I feel like Jaws is aware of that and was like, I don't think I'm going to get yelled. I just get the job done while everybody's too busy chatting. <laughs> so as you're coming in, uh, you you start to notice whoever's on whoever's on systems at any point, you notice a few things. Okay, so so this is all just console stuff. You're just checking your sensors and things. You're getting some kind of you're getting radio signals from a, from two different from two different places. One's on the southern side of this this large vegetative area, which, when you take a look at it, is a couple square miles. Uh, and then the, another one on the northern side. So southern side and northern side both seem to have radio signals. Um, neither one of them are picking up actual... Like, no one's communicating with you, but you can see that there's sort of live signal there. Um, and you do notice that the that this kind of vegetative area, the radiation kind of erupting from it is all in a very precise, it's a very precise pattern, actually. Like, it's it's not, it's not, it's not some sort of random blob. It all seems very localized uh, in between these two signals. Uh, and each one of those signals is a couple kilometers. One's like a couple kilometers north, one's a couple kilometers south. And what was the relation of those with the kind of radioactive hotspot? There was nothing mentioned about radio signals or anything like that. It was just the radiation and the vegetation were the two things mentioned. Uh, you do know that you have an advanced team down here. Um, okay. So it's possible one of those is a base camp set up by your advanced team. Well, Jaws, why don't you set us down there by the southern little radio signal and we'll see what they have to tell us on the surface. Will do. Okay. Uh, and you already rolled it, so you don't got to roll for landing or any of that. But yeah, you managed to, to set down. It's fine. Not my best. You find, uh, you find a, a spot that'll work somewhere large and flat. And most of this place is large and flat, except for these very fairly craggy uh, mountain, uh, mountain ranges here and there, a series of craters. Um, but you land. Oh, issues. You still haven't been contacted uh, at all. Uh, you're a very large ship that just came into orbit, basically just to fly over uh, on top of what you presume is a base camp for your advanced survey team, and you've now landed. What would you like to do? Let's go for a walk. Go for a ride. Oh, even better, young man. Let's go for a ride. All right, so we've got what? Somebody else can four. call shotgun. I'm driving. We've got four that'll fit on that. <laughs> Uh, it's two per. Two per. Yeah. Somebody mentioned it in uh, chat. Is I think uh, it's actually I think it's the ones from Prometheus because it's the two seaters. Mm. Um, what do we have for weapons other than I don't know if anybody started with anything. 
Uh, you have your, okay. your your standard array. Like uh, you you would have. What do you have? You have the plasma rifle, right? Don't you have? A... I have plasma rifle and the the, the armor. But does, like, do we have a stock? Because you said we we're quite well equipped. So mm -hmm. is there? Would there be anything else? Like yeah, you would have. Like you would have backups, but you probably wouldn't be giving these out to everyone on the ship. There's probably only maybe no. three or four people who would be you. Would, you would trust with actually using weapons. No, I was gonna toss one to Chet. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know who my buddy is. You want to Chet to my to okay. my <laughs> my office, my security office, and toss him a handgun? Yeah, that's oh, not man. a problem. That's not a problem. Take, and I'll, take your uh, I'll throw my armor on and take my my plasma rifle and we'll get ready to head out. Okay. I'm uh, I'm I'm riding shotgun with Chet. Okay. okay. What I'll take whatever weapon uh, Sergeant recommends. I'll toss you a Magnum. Awesome. All right. So there's two. Uh, I've got a come, pistol. Come on, Rook. I'll ride with you. You can drive me around. Uh, sure, you want that? Why wouldn't I, friend? This will be great. A little vacation. Cruise on the beach. You don't want your other scientists with you? Well, she needs someone to drive her around, too. You see, that we got we got an issue here, then. Mm-hmm. We have two of these ATVs. I thought you said there was four of them. There's oh, there was four. There's four, yeah, and they sit. They sit two per person, so you can. Oh, well okay. then, yeah, I would have just. For the six of you. I would have just wordlessly got in with you then. <laughs> okay. All right. I guess we're doing it this way. <laughs> Great, so like a we'll Sunday just, drive. Jaws will slide into the driver's seat of one, and then just sort of look back to Bones. Oh, wonderful! You are who I wanted to ride with, anyway. Hop on in. Nah, I'm going to get my digital camera out and start taking pictures. Okay, fair enough. Happy to be your tour guide. So you all start driving. Sorry. You all start driving. Not a problem. Um, so you, yeah, you sit, you sit down within reason. Like, it's not going to take you forever to get there. But you also don't set it too close. And, and the, the minute you all get out onto this relatively flat surface and you look, we'll say, eastward, um, to the southern, to kind of the southern camp, you do notice that there's, uh, there do appear to be a handful of temporary structures that have been set up. Like, and they're probably familiar. You you have some of your own, uh, but most you you usually take your ship in and in and down. But there there are times when you have to kind of set up temporary base camps and everything. Um, you see a handful uh, of of those off in the distance, probably about two three kilometers away, and you begin driving. Um, I would say, like, the drive's relatively simple. Uh, it's very flat ground, uh, very dry. Uh, you can see that there's a significant number of cracks and crevices, but you don't really have any trouble avoiding them. Um, you notice absolutely no signs of any kind of vegetation here. You notice no flowers, you notice no weeds, you notice nothing. There's nothing scurrying about here or there. It's a very hard caked earth. Uh, and you also, can feel all of you are in suits, but you can feel that there is a bit of warmth uh, that you are getting here. It's not the easiest temperature uh, to deal with. You are in kind of the, the brighter part of the of the moon. Uh, but eventually you get within closer distance uh, of the actual camp itself, and you can see a few things. You can see that there are three specific buildings, uh, two of which seem relatively small. One seems a little bit larger. Um, you notice that there have been some kind of like solar panel setups and stuff for generation, for, for generation, power generation. Um, you notice that there's a lot of turned up earth, uh, like kind of, you can see it's, it's suffer, you know, it's, it's not the flat caked ground that you've driven here on, but it's, looks like it's, it's suffered some kind of activity. Uh, and it's in a fairly large, uh, a large radius, uh, just outside of these three buildings, about hundred yards away or so. Um, you do notice that there's a couple lights that have been set up, these big old broad lights. One of them is kind of hanging loosely from a wire. It doesn't seem to be sitting properly. Uh, and you notice nobody moving around. Um, it's all very quiet. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, call over, uh, the intercom to, um, Hobart. Say, Hobart. You want to take Captain. a look or take a look around the perimeter before we go any further in? I do declare you remain in your vehicles while 
Chat, <laughs> I can't. Sorry, <laughs> crack, I do declare you remain in your vehicles while Chat and I take a look at the perimeter. Yeah. Uh, copy that. Hey, uh, Buckland. Uh, uh, you know, I turned the intercom off. Hey, Buckland, what do you make of this? This uh, whole planet here? No signs of life anywhere except for mm -hmm. this one place. Well, something's amiss. Um, I mean, they should have received our broadcast signals as they as we approached. They should have come out. The fact that there's some kind of trauma to the ground around here. Seismic activity, maybe. I don't know. But also the fact that that light there is damaged and Noah's seemed to repair to it. Um, you think that this planet at all would have any winds that would be would get uh you know rough enough or maybe some storms or whatnot usually a tidally locked planet like this doesn't have the atmospheric rotation needed to produce large form winds like that so no huh. all right yeah that's the... that's cause for concern then mm-hmm uh -huh. Well, I will be quite uh, curious what our good Mr. Hobart finds. Okay, so what's everybody doing? Sorry, we're having our own... <laughs> Reading <little>. chat. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Sorry. Um, so for now, you guys are outside of camp. You have No one's approached it yet, uh, but you definitely see the things you see. Um, let's see. Um, Dr. Buckman, did you actually wanted to look at the ground? That, that the upturned ground it's not actually in oh. the middle of that little camp it's 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 a ways away but you can see it from here it's been torn up but no okay. i'm for once in a creepy situation like this i am going to listen to what hobart okay. recommended okay all right so what is everybody doing then uh rook actually readies his pistol after he hears what buckland has to say about that light he just checks it and makes sure it's ready to go Okay. Right. Hey, uh, hey, Jaws, Bones. Yeah. Either of you armed? Yeah. I mean, I, I have my tools, but, um, no. Any of them tools you can defend yourself with? I suppose. Just a pickaxe, back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd say it does. Better off than I am. Okay. Is anyone approaching the camp? Uh, yeah, I will. And I've got a motion uh, tracker, detector, what do I have? Okay. I have a motion tracker, so I'm going to use that also as... I'm going to tell Chet to check the perimeter with me, and I'll turn on the motion tracker. Are we going quiet, sir? Indeed. Both of you uh, go ahead and roll mobility, then. Uh, for keeping stealthy, and then roll your power supply for your um, for your motion tracker. What do I roll again for power supply? Just the the number of d sixes. It should actually be built into the item now, I think. But if not, just cool. whatever the power supply number is, just roll that many d sixes. And any ones you get basically are um, reduce oh, cool. the power okay. supply. I see it. It's always rechargeable too, so it's just kind of a temporary thing ones all right okay so you're good um i'm pretty sure so the only motion that you're getting are the group around you you don't see any signs from the camp specifically um periodically you see a little blip but you can very quickly notice that it's just the light kind of shifting and moving as it's hanging down but it doesn't seem to be doing anything but yeah it seems to be motionless in here and you have um and you know, and you trust that the range would encompass the entirety of the camp. You're pretty confident there's no, no movement currently. I just want to point out, holy crap! You have 11 dice for mobility. Kids, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chet Sorry, I just noticed a, that. Chet is a thieving, sneaky little bastard. Oh yeah. We uh, when 
because we, like we were always kind of a little worried about Chet rolling when you guys didn't know that he was a synthetic because he had so many dice certain times and he never had like you know it's dress dice stuff was but now you actually can you can fake it with the character sheet now they've added that functionality yeah i nice. saw that there's a thing where you can make it oh man yeah what a great option yeah it's a clever idea uh okay um so yeah you you get no no motion whatsoever sorry sergeant and hobart no no motion what about like signs like is is there like uh tools or anything left out like maybe someone was in the middle of working and and they've just like left what they were doing all of a sudden you uh you do notice that there is uh on the far side there is an atv similar to yours um that's left to the side uh doesn't seem to be hooked up to its like recharge station um you don't see any tools there's no workspaces out here uh it's just three buildings that are kind of connected there's there's rope lines uh, mm-hmm. kind of connecting each one of these buildings, but that's it. Uh, but you don't see any tools or anything out here. No no workbenches, nothing like that. Um, would I know which one would be the main building of the three that were set up just through experience? Yeah, you would probably guess that uh, one of these is, is probably just for kind of storage. Um, and you would guess that's the one where the ATV is parked against. Uh, one of these is probably a lab of some kind or, you know, an assessment, uh, like where they kind of assess geological samples and things like that. And one is probably for where they, where they actually stay, where they, where they sleep. Um, you would guess probably the big, bigger of the buildings is the one where they would do most of their work. Okay. I'm going to motion to Chet because we're moving in silently to, that we're heading to the main building. Okay. All right. Both of you had one successes on your mobilities. None of you want to get satisfied with one success. Cool with that? Yes. Okay. All right. So you head over towards the main building. Uh, you move into the camp. You hear the slight screech of metal on metal as the the light swings as you walk past it. Uh, it's like the only sound, which is a little peculiar. And it's just it's muffled because it's kind of getting through your suits. Uh, but you see the door. It's a sort of an airlock setup. It seems to be like you have to go in through one, close, zipper up, then you go in uh, to the interior side of the interior part of the building. What are the rest of you doing? Uh, I'm waiting for uh, the report to come back. Okay, so you're just you're just hanging back. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ask, friends is just waiting. What do we have? What I have a camera on my suit. Would we be broadcasting back to them? They could could they see what we're seeing? I would say because it's Wayland. Yes. Okay. You are well stocked. I would say Rook. You probably have a small little, you know, little little monitor that you can look at. I actually have a PDAT. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, and yeah, you open up. You go inside. Uh, and to close the door. You know, you zip her up behind you. You go in keep your suits on you can tell that you can tell immediately coming in here that like there's a lot of those types of sounds like this is this is sort of pressurized in some way you can see there's tanks of oxygen here and there so this is an oxidated area so conceivably you could take your suits off if you wanted to um but you see right now it's very dark in here uh there's no lights other than what you bring but you you probably have on your suits like a quick little uh, floodlight that'll pop in and you look around, and yeah, the the room itself, uh, this building itself, is probably about a hundred feet in length, um, and maybe half as wide, and it's filled with uh, examination tables, and it looks like tons and tons of samples have been set up. There's also a series of monitors, uh, servers as well. Um, you can tell that they don't seem to be powered up currently. There's no flashing lights or doohickeys or anything like that uh, suggesting that they're powered down for some reason there's also the lights aren't on when you came in and you would imagine they would probably have come on when you came in so it doesn't seem that this 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 little kind of tent building has power um but that's what you see you just see all the way back and you can't see the whole entire room when you just came in but you can just see series after the series after series of looks like maybe somewhere between seven and ten large examination tables uh, right down the middle, and then smaller desks with monitor stations and servers on the sides. Anything on the examination tables? Uh, immediately in front of you, you notice that there's uh, there's different rocks. There's different chunks of rocks, some of which seem to 
the ores as opposed to just, you know, just kind of cake dirt. Um, roll an observation test. <laughs> Doohickeys is a very technical term. It's 1978. Okay. I'll take it. So, the two of you, you kind of you're examining the tables. Um, pretty much everything in here is just chunks of rocks and ore. Um, most you would say are some of them are recognizable. You would be able to tell, you know, certain some of these are precious metals. Others you would probably need somebody with a more scientific background to be able to identify. But one thing stands out that is different than other things. You notice uh, on one of the central tables uh, that there is a large cylindrical but wiry and kind of it's not perfect it's not a perfect cylinder but it's it's kind of wiry and bent and broken black substance substance as in it almost looks like organic a, it almost looks like a synthetic? like a branch like a like a broken branch maybe about six feet long undulating here and there bent but it looks organic in nature, or it looks black. When you get up close, it definitely has kind of a textured feel to it. Like if you're not, I mean, you don't have to touch it. You can just kind of tell by just shining the light on it. It's definitely textured. I mean, it it it, it would probably remind you maybe of like petrified wood. Maybe. Okay. Um, I'll I'll speak in the comms. They're they're watching, aren't yeah. they? They're all watching, or is it just Rook? They're all. I, I would say it depends if they're all. They all have their own yeah. probably PDATs, or they can like look so, over yeah. his shoulder or something like that. So just for ease. Uh, say Bones, what do you make of this? Uh, I would have to get a closer look. I can't just look at it and tell you anything. Is it? Is it warm to the touch? I am not touching this. I have poke it for science. I have Chet no. touch the thing. <laughs> Chet, 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 no. <laughs> Are, are you really touching it? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm... <laughs> are you really touching it? It's not good with Jeff has said. I can't believe you touched it. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Buckland said hey, to do it for science. Hold up it's on that. It's fine. We can replace him. Hold does up it, on that shit. Does it rub off? Does it like, is it grainy? Oh, uh, b belay that chat. Uh, Roll a mobility test, chat. <laughs> oh my. Just smack his hand out of the way. Oh man! <laughs> well, it was fun for a while. It lasted. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put Don't your, put lips, your lips, on lips on it. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Yes. Oh, he wow. really wanted Jeez. to touch it. Chet, are you wearing a suit? Um, I think so, just to kind of be part of the gang. <laughs> okay, you okay. You just like, want to have the uniform on? Yeah, it's like mostly for the fun of it. Okay, fair enough. If anything, he probably like mimics like Dr. Budluck, Buckland's silly helmet. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you reach down, you go to touch it, you hear Rook say, no, don't do that. Hobart tries to smack your hand away, but you're just too fast. You're just too fast, you're too quick. And your hand reaches out and you touch it. And you immediately see it react. You it would look like a petrified branch, this black petrified branch almost. Suddenly undulates and moves and bends and pulls away from where you had touched it. You see it just sort of recoil a bit. I'm going in. No, I am I... not rubbing that thing off. <laughs> All right. Huh? <laughs> God damn it, Jeremy. <laughs> Hobart, is this safe in there? No. No, it is not safe. We have not finished our uh, reconnaissance. Um, I'm out of the little ATV. I'm going. Shit. Um, I, I uh, get out on foot and, you know, like, I, I had some, like, uh, like, like a little package of, like, beer nuts or something like that that I was munching on and, like, um, they Did you open your suit the... up to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, okay. yeah. You can do that. You're okay away. to yeah, do that yeah. temporarily. And so I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there, like getting the helmet on and getting everything together. Okay. And and the beer nuts. I'm I'm smart enough to at least let them spill on the floor of the ATV. I don't let them get outside. Okay. Um, right. because I'm sure Buckland has yelled at me for something like that in the past, or Bones, one of the two. And You're so trying then, to grow a beer nut tree. And yeah, so then like I uh. Uh, and like getting out and like getting everything buckled up and ready to go as I'm not about to let Buckland walk in there 
um, by himself. And as much as uh, he annoys me, I'm not going to let him die. <laughs> I need you to I make a one in charge. Of this. I need you to make a stamina test, though, Rook. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> stamina. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Space nuts. <laughs> uh, do you want to push? Uh, I will say that there is a penalty to failing this. Should. Do you have a free push? Yeah, there are there are two. We we have two left. The roll of rose of Captain Karayan from previous. So those were the last ones we're doing though in terms of these the leftovers. So you're welcome to use it if you want. I mean, we, nobody has any stress yet, so let's just do the normal push. Okay, go for it. Okay. There we go. All right, you're able to. Uh, you're able. Like you had your you had the helmet off. You're munching on some nuts. <laughs> it opens the door. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> didn't feel great, uh, but. <laughs> But you, uh, yeah, you, uh, you feel a little dizzy and kind of wounded. Uh, your eyes water a little bit, uh, but you're I, okay. I would like to know while I was watching him take his helmet to eat beer nuts, I was just taking notes, just watching him intently. It's interesting. It's <laughs> a classic one right there. Okay. So Dr. Bucklin, you ran, you got there. No problem. You go inside, no problem. You see them. You see that weird thing which has stopped moving. It just shifted. You can see it it shifted its shape and then didn't do anything again. Uh, huh. Jaws and Bones, what are you two doing? Jaws is sort of the driver, so Jaws is waiting for Bones' direction. I'm just going to look at um, Jaws and shake my head. I'm not going then in there. I mean, there's things moving around that shouldn't be moving. Well, I have a gun, so it's probably a good idea for me to be in the places where something is moving. So, Sorry. would you like to stay here or join? Well, I don't want to be left behind. I, I guess uh, you lead the way and I'll take up the rear. Sounds good. So I'll have my pistol at the ready. Okay. So is anybody not going inside? Just so you know, I'm protesting. I don't want to go in there. I understand. But this is how science happens, right? You tell me all the time. You science see and drifts are two different you look things. At it. Come on, saying. Jaws. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love it. Chapter two is only gonna be one episode. It's gonna be where we done so fast. I love it. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. All of you get inside. No problem. And you see everything that I described previously. It's a dark room. You only have your own lights. Uh, there, there are tons of geological samples all over the all over the place on several different uh, several different examination tables. You've got the consoles and servers along the sides um, that seem to be powered down. So exciting. Are there any rubber totes, like large rubber totes, full or empty? Uh, there are boxes, like st like some crates and stuff stacked up here. You would probably guess that some of those are likely crates for uh, for the equipment um, that have just been emptied. And then others are possibly where they're storing additional samples. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a few of those, like tucked under tables here and there. Kind of scattered okay, around. I'll grab a crate and set it on the opposite side of the weird branch. Okay. Then I'll go back around the other side. I'm going to try and poke it to see if I can get it to back away from me, fall off the table, and land mm -hmm. in that crate. Okay. So you're gonna go poke. I want to get behind. No, I want to get between Doctor Buckland and and this thing. No, 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 no. I'm just trying to get it boxed up so we can take it with us. Nope, we're not touching that thing. We're here for Cap science, my good friend. Yeah, Captain so, Rook, you get on, you, know, you get in back that ship, and you talk to Mother, and we're gonna find out what we're doing with this before we touch anything else. You know how it goes, Doc. You know this is the this is the time that what he says goes is when we could be in danger. So very well. Like 
we compromise it, we get a stick and we poke it with a stick. That was going to be my <laughs> next question. I don't know if it recognized Ch Chet as an organic or non-organic organism. I would like to see what happens when we try to prod it with something inorganic. Well, you know, as much as I would really like to know the burning questions that we all have about this, mm -hmm. I'd really like to know what happened to the people that were here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Probably drinking on the job. It's not a big deal. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I am going to examine this, but I promise I will not touch it and I will not get within three feet of it. Why don't you just wait a little bit? It's not going anywhere. It might. We saw it move. It did move. Why don't we find out what happened to the people that were here? Very yeah. well. Because this thing might sneak up on you and get you once you leave. That's enough, Chet. <laughs> Simma. <laughs> okay. A mother of uh, bones and jaws uh, entered. Are they like in the vicinity of this thing now? Yeah, I would say the two of you are probably the last to arrive, but yeah, you're here. Okay. Do we, um, do we have a roughneck? Is someone a roughneck? You do, oh. but it's an NPC on the ship. Mm. <laughs> is, would this be considered a strange artifact? Uh, this is certainly something. Um, it's hard to tell whether or not this is an artifact or organic material it's moving but talent was moving. That. if you're looking to identify something um, yeah yeah roll science test science well sorry science. what did i say uh not science it's called uh hang one on. of the wit skills observation S uh survival no no wait. survival is it survival i believe it's survival it's one of those three uh okay <laughs> You, we narrowed it down. You would be able to determine, um, just by looking at this, this does, in fact, actually, it looks organic. It looks like a root, like part of a root. Uh, as you as you kind of lean down and look, you don't get too close to it, but you lean down and look. There's a, there's more lights in the room now, and they're all kind of shining down on this thing. You can see that there's, like, these little frayed areas here and there that suggest this might have been kind of a subterranean piece. Um, there's residue of dirt and stuff on it as well that suggests that at least this part right here might have been buried you would guess this is a root there's you know, a little bit of dirt here this looks like it is part of some kind of root system i wonder if this matches that radioactivity and fauna we should see if they've got some kind of geiger counter around here to see if it matches the radioactive bits they were talking about in that memo i did notice there wasn't very much flana flora Anything green, really. I mean, this planet's mostly rocky. Well, it could be with a significant oh, yeah. radioactive source. It could be completely subterranean. While they're chatting, I want to be poking around and see if I can find a generator or a power source. Something to turn on to get the lights back on in this room. Even uh, if that has to take me outside. You do recall seeing that there is kind of a solar power generator outside. Yeah. Once we watch you six... Uh, you, st <laughs> you stay here, Chet. You look after them. I'm going to go try and get some power going here. Okay. Hey, Chet. Yeah. Chet, you're looking for something to do. I'm going to need someone that can determine if there's any outgoing messages that they sent recently. Any signs mm -hmm. of uh, anything that would denote that they tried to leave some sort of warning for us. Mm -hmm. anything like that so as soon as that power comes back on I'm going to need you to do that in a hurry okay do you think you can do that for me yeah better than anybody else here of course right. I think I know you can yeah uh, Jen go ahead and roll an extra d6 because uh, let's shoot this like an observation test looks like you have one more point in observation than survival to see if you got an extra success. So no, you didn't. Okay, so yeah, you just get the one, the one detail then, because you do actually have analysis. Yeah. Okay, so outside, 
Hobart, you come to this. Go over to one of the other smaller buildings. There is this big generator that's set up. Uh, a series of solar panels that seem to be uh, helping to kind of fuel it. Uh, this part, you can definitely tell that there's a fairly there's a, a ton of light. Like it's uh, this is this would this should be charged up pretty well. But you do notice that most of the cabling that runs from the generator into these other these three buildings seems to have been detached uh, or frayed in some way. Frayed in what way? Does it look like someone like kind of? Like, cut it with a knife, or yeah. naturally? Oh. What a great question. Something that an observation test might reveal. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh! I mean, from my previous observation, it kind of looked like it was torn away just by the root system. It's a little bit jagged. So, okay, so, so Hobart's looking at the cables... When you take a look, you do notice that it looks like the parts of the cables that that are like there's a couple that are just straight up unplugged, but there's like two of them that are completely cut, and it looks like it looks like they were they they, they it doesn't look like anyone like cut through them. It just looked like more like they got damaged from something heavy going over top of it. Mm, so it was more okay. like it was cr they were Scraping. crushed and scraped. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna try and reconnect them to the generator or where they're whatever they were headed to, if and hope that they'll still work. Do we have the equivalent of like electrical tape or something like that, like something we could repair this I think with? Duct tape exists in the alien universe, but like I mean, a heavy machinery would, would roll would get this get this fixed. I think. Okay. I'm gonna use one of my free re rolls. Go for it. There we go. One down. All right. Yeah. It'll take you a little bit of time, probably about half an hour, but you'll be able to finish it up. What are the rest of you doing in the meantime? Trying. Yeah, I'm just drooling over this route. Okay. Yeah, Rook is keeping an eye over Dr. Buckland, uh, like both struggling with the fact that he's trying to keep him from hurting himself, but also keep him from hurting everyone else. Um, Bones is going to take out a brush, uh, probably one of the ones she was about to throw away, and see if she can take some of the dirt off this root system and put it into a little tray. Okay. Uh, I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> really don't think you want to do that. Well, I'm not touching it. Uh, it's just a little bit of dirt. It'll I want to get the dirt next to the source. I get uh, look. my gun out and just sort of just just let her do it. Yeah, I'm not think... pointing at you. I'm just saying. Yeah, right. yeah that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. You, you think fast. so? You think it'll be okay? It's just a brush. What do you think, Doctor Buckland? I am excited to see what happens. Me too. Okay. Uh, I hope shit. she doesn't die. Roll a mobility test, Bones. Okay, um, one second. One second. Let me just roll what? these ten d sixes really fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Okay. All right. Um, so you uh, you lean down and you start to very carefully and gingerly take your brush and start to dust away some of the sediment that is at the end of what looks like a root. As you do so. You notice that where that little sprouting was, like a like a root sprout, you know, like the, the kind of the very thin roots that haven't quite fully developed, they immediately extend, like scylla, like they're just moving and they're extending outward in your direction, and they wrap around your brush. You're able to quickly enough let go and move back before they continue to extend around your hands, but they do they have grasp your brush at this point. Sacrificial mm. brush it is. Oh. That was awkward. So we have the question that it uh, it reacts to non-organic material as well. That's exciting. Oh, well, hey, now. Uh, I'm no longer excited. Wait. Uh, what? What's that brush made out of? Yeah, I believe this is my boar brush. So it's made out of boar yeah. hairs? 
Yeah, my synthetic one, it's still in good shape, so. Well, I mean, I don't know too much about uh, science, but wouldn't you say that that's organic? That I, okay? would, <laughs> I would. I <sighs> would. Should I gather as many different things as possible to poke it with? Yes. I don't well, think that's a good idea. Let's we don't just know get a, what this thing's going to do. Let's just get a really big rock and poke it with a really big rock in a scientific manner. Someday I'm going to be a scientist just oh, like I you. I think Mr. Buckland should do that then. I would be my pleasure. Mr. Why don't you just throw the rock? Yeah. You don't have I'd... to still be connected to it when it touches it. Hey, uh... But what if it has sentience of some form? It could take that I as an attack. I can't throwing rocks at this thing that just moved. All right, right everybody, calm down. Everybody will get their turn with the killer stick. <laughs> I'm used to things being already dead. I don't understand what this is. This is exciting. This is what it is. Out of my field of reference. Okay. Uh, to who's doing what? I need you to be ready for when that power comes back on, okay? That's, okay. That's real so, important. I'm going to be right next to this. Uh, I'm right next to the screen, but I also have a rock ready. All right, well. So as, I can do your thing and do that. As much as I love rocks, you know me. I think it's, uh, I think it's, you know, we need to wait on rocks. Now, if anyone's in trouble, that might be the time to let that rock fly. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, you don't have any poking doodads, uh, Doc? As I look towards Dr. Buckland. Not, not on the exterior of my suit. Um, you got I mean, poking doodads inside your suit? I, I <laughs> do. I read his diary. He does. There's always your pipe. You've got more of those. I would never. Oh, you'd have to take the, that helmet off to get his pipe out. Let me look around here to see if I can find some kind of probe. And I didn't read your diary. I couldn't figure out the password. It's for the best. Probably. So go ahead and roll an observation test, Buckley, as Buckland, as you start to look around for something. Okay. Second success. Yeah. You um you find uh what basically just looks like a rock pick, uh, and then it looks like you have a much bigger pick as well. So you have like an old fashioned uh like two handed swinging uh pick that you could potentially poke with it. Sure, I'll do that. Okay. And just very lightly just tap it. All right, so you very lightly tap it, and you see that it reacts. Like, it definitely, like, if are you tapping it in the same place? That No. Okay, so just somewhere else. Okay, you yeah. just tap it, and you see it, again, just reform ever so slightly. This is exciting. So there we go. We have an unorganic thing that we just poked it with. Mm-hmm. I do. And it's at this point that the lights come on. <laughs> I start typing away. Uh, Bones is slowly backing up and edging towards a wall okay. to get as far away from this undulating, okay. not dead stick. As long as it's not being poked, it does seem to be motionless. It's doing, I mean, like, it's me it's still messing with the brush, but other than that, it's it seems fairly motionless. But you back away to one of the walls, and I want to say a hand, like, drops on your shoulder, but that doesn't happen. Uh, you just, you just bump, in, <laughs> you just bump into a desk, and there's a computer on it, so. Oh. Jurassic Park. I want to, I want a Jurassic Park, yeah. I want to say Samuel Jackson's arm. I was waiting for it. it the wall is kind of sticky, and you don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you do see that the servers are also kind of starting to power up as well. They're humming. Um, it does seem like the uh, yeah the whole whole place is power again. Uh, outside Hobart, you see that the uh, the lights uh, are beginning to flicker back on, and you can hear that the generator's humming once more. Uh, it's kind of a quick patch job. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it'll do. Okay. Uh, what's the next closest building to me? I'd like to go you're in right there next and take a to look. one. Yeah, you're right next to one. 
Okay, is it the the living quarters or the other? No, you would think it's not. You would think this is probably more like this is this is this is probably more utility storage something okay. like that. I'll poke my head in there. Yeah, you poke I'll inside. Back on. You poke inside. Nothing in nothing seems out of the ordinary. Uh, it looks like you basically have a lot of equipment uh, equipment cases. You see the Wayland Utani logo in a lot of these cases. That kind of uh, that the, the orange or like yellow orange W the kind of black cases here and there, um, you uh, yeah it doesn't look like people are meant to spend a significant amount of time in here. It just looks like stuff is kind of just stacked up. Um, you can see that some of the cases are labeled. Some of them are like foodstuffs, and and others seem to be more like utility pieces, uh, things like that. Just taking a peek inside some of the cases, like, are is what's supposed to be in there in there? Yeah, you open up some stuff and you see, yeah, dried MRE stuff, uh, big old, big old stack of it, completely, you know. Um, you do notice as you start going through stuff that you start doing some calculations in your head and you, you notice that there's some cases missing. You start thinking about how long this survey team would be here, how many resources they should actually have here. Then there's like places where it looks like cases once were, but have likely been moved. They have like that faint little outline on the ground of where like they had been sitting and resting for a long time. You would guess that there's there's cases missing. Okay. Um. Okay. I'll write over. Like, uh, Captain, how is everything going on in there? Do you have power? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, well, we have figured out that it's that it's going to react to being touched no matter what it's touched what? with. What? In tarnation? I told you not to touch that thing. Yeah, I know. I did what I could. Put your captain pants on and get control of your crew. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> Burn. Well, that's a good idea. He's gonna put on his captain pants. Captain pants. You're gonna take those. <laughs> no, I'm the captain <laughs> now. You're gonna wear them. <laughs> button the quick. Button. <laughs> Rook, give me your pants. <laughs> They're button flies. All right. Uh, I was just gonna see if it responds to the fire. No, let's not do anything else. It's, uh, I wasn't um, going to catch it on fire. I was just going to move fire no, close no. to it. Oh. Okay, I've had enough of this. We're not doing okay. anything. Okay. So we're just going to sit tight. Okay. Do you guys just stay Shit. in here? Or? Yeah. Shit. Come with me and take a look at this other this other building. Well, one sec, real quick. Uh, the, the captain asked me to, to check and see if there are any messages... Um, I'll be as quick as I can, I promise. Sorry, sir. Wow. You're calling sir me? But, I mean, <laughs> that's both. right. He picked, he picked Rook over Hobart. Did you see? Everyone Ooh. saw that, right? Oh, my God. I know. Well, I, I mean, know. I've been sitting there waiting. Like The only person who listens to the captain, huh? Uh, so, Chet, you want to hit the, you want to hit the computers? Yeah. Comtech. I told him I would. There it is. Okay. Is there something specific you're looking for with that one success? He was asking me to check for like any recent messages. That's probably what I would like search for initially. Is like any recent messages outgoing or incoming. Okay. Um Okay. So if you're looking for specifically message logs, uh, you do see, like, they're not recent, but you do see uh, communications sent from here, like, via, like you, you basically tap into, like, their, their, the logs of their, their mother communications, but it's really mm -hmm. just sort of, like, reporting of findings and stuff like that. Okay. Um, most of it seems almost redundant to what you have now. Um, mm -hmm. There is... One additional um, piece of information that you would find in in some of the messages is that they describe how um, when they were doing a flyover of the the site in their shuttle, um, that they described it. They described the actual vegetative growth as a spiral, 
and they just frequently refer to it as just like a spiral jungle. So a couple couple bits, mm. a shuttle which you don't notice any in the base camp, and then the description of the actual layout of the uh, of the site. All right, here you go, Cap. Something about a shuttle that came through in a spiral jungle. I'm gonna hop real quick over to Sarge. <laughs> All right, Doctor Buckland. Bones, you want to look at that together? See if you can put your heads together. I think you're muted, Chuck. Yes, I was. Um, sure, I can. I can give a Rita message about a spiral jungle. Sure. Yeah. Um. So if the two of you get on consoles and you actually just start digging through more thoroughly, not just looking at like basic email messages, like you start digging through some of the reports, you'll get additional info. Like you'll see that they've described apparently insects, flowers uh, are like they, they describe them as being peculiar, um, also monochromatic. Uh, that everything is kind of this sort of dark blackish, almost like this dark dark blackish color with like a kind of a hint of almost like an oily, you know, like blue green that kind of appears when the light hits it correct. But other than that, it's it's mostly just like this kind of almost black vegetation in a, in a, in a strange way. But there are flowers, apparently. They describe that they think there's something larger um, moving about in the jungle, but they haven't seen it directly. Uh, and they don't have the equipment to do any kind of trapping of any kind. Um, but it does look they try to, to, to dig deeper or try to kind of push into the integral, but they described it as getting thicker and thicker the further towards the center they got. Now, that is exciting. So... Well, Dr. Stewart, what do you think about this? The monochromatic is interesting. I'll grab a flashlight and I want to go inspect that root again. See if I can get that bluish hue they're talking about to show. Okay. Yeah, you start playing around with the angle a bit. And since you know exactly what you're looking for at a certain point, yeah, it hits it. It's it's sort of just like looking at almost like oil and how if you look at it long enough, occasionally these little like traces of color start to emerge from like the light hitting it. But it's very faint. I don't think anything of it. I think it's strange. I want nothing to do with it. Well, that's fantastic. It makes me wonder if everything's the same color that is observing the world in a different way. Um, looking through the sh or thinking about the supplies we have on the ship, would we have some kind of like spectrum analysis tool so I can kind Absolutely. of see what? Yeah. You'd have that very exact tool that you just described. Fuck yeah. <laughs> they spare no expense. <laughs> very good. Uh, Jaws, um, how would you feel about taking a little drive and picking up something from the lab for me? Uh, that's fine. Um, Bones, would you like to take a break from your... Uh proximity to this thing and uh, go back with me or are you yes to stay that, that's a fine idea yes yes <laughs> we can go back i'll show you exactly what he's asking for i'll be very helpful fantastic sounds yeah. good so to you head back to the ship yep okay um so hobart and chet uh you were going where now the third building the okay. one that we hadn't searched go to the third building it's definitely living quarters. See a couple bunks set up. It looks like there's enough for six people. Um, it's a little bit messy, but it's not terrible. Nothing's out of, Nothing looks demonstrably messy. But yeah, it's a little messy here and there. A couple of the beds aren't made. A few are. Um, you notice that there's a kind of little kitchenette in the back uh, where a couple plates and stuff have been stacked up there looks to be a table uh immediately upon entry you do notice that one of the legs is broken so it's tipped a little off to the side um looks like they tried to balance it out with something but it's just not quite right 
Um, but yeah, that's what, and then there's like foot lockers and things like that, where it looks like they probably kept their clothes and personal effects. I was going to ask, are there lockers and foot lockers? And if so, I'd like to search through all those. Okay. Um, so yeah, you start digging through them. Uh, you find some personal effects. Uh, you do notice that three of the foot lockers are fairly empty. Uh, you don't really see any signs of like, there's only like maybe one pair of clothes in here. Um, whereas all the others have like three or four. Uh, and then you notice a couple personal effects. You get the names of various people. You see one for Laura Foster, one for Kev Lipson, one for Leslie Adol. I'll give you the names for this later. Uh, Jerry Murphy, uh, Owen Crawley, and uh, and Jose Para. Those seem to be the names of the crew, uh, the, the advanced survey team. And specifically, um, the ones that were kind of empty uh what lo looks like like the you can even tell that the foot lockers were actually open when you came in it's almost as if people were quickly pulling stuff out uh were kev uh, kev lipson leslie adol and jerry murphy all three of them the other ones seem to be left normal i say what do you make of this chet not sure Maybe if we could find like a record of who's supposed to be in here, we could see who, whose stuff isn't here. And maybe I'm curious where they are. Or I mean, they're probably dead. What? Let's be honest. <laughs> Don't tell the others that, Chet. I mean, they already uh, know everybody's dead. No, no. Uh, let's not get everybody worried. Uh, would the records most likely be back in that main? Um, yeah, I mean, the there's that everybody else is in. There's too. a console in here as well. Um, so right. you, you do see that there's a couple personal consoles. Let's roll, kinda... roll an observation test if you guys want. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, when when uh, Hobart says, "Let's not tell everybody that," I finally mute my PDAT. <laughs> and I just, I just, I, I look over, at, I look over at Buckland and shrug. <laughs> Listen, we already knew they were dead. I yeah, we there's did. more important things here. Okay. All right. Did you want to push Maybe. Uh, Hobart? Both of you. Wow. Ten dice. I'll my, yeah, I'll use my last reroll and get those out of the way. Get them gone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Get, those, get those out of here. Yeah, there you know what? Okay. I will too. Let's just get, get those rerolls out of here. Rip there that band-aid off. Rely on your just gonna rely on yourselves from now on. No one's gonna yeah. try. Okay. Um Okay, so you guys notice you, you do notice a few things. Um you notice that the uh, the beds that are unmade and the foot lockers that are empty-ish, uh, they're all the same people. And you also notice that they're all like bottom bunks, uh, except for one. Um, Chet, as you're wandering around, you're a little bit shorter than Hobart. You, you kind of notice that everybody on the underside of the bunks, they have like pictures and things of people that they have... You know, mm -hmm. you see family, children, spouses, that kind of stuff. Um, you notice another, another two, uh, specifically uh, Kev Lipson and Leslie Adol, uh, who are on the bottom bunks. Uh, you notice they don't have any pictures uh, up, but they are scattered onto the floor and kind of swept underneath their beds. And you notice that underneath on the underside of the the top bunk where they would be looking up you notice that something has been drawn and it's kind of the same image and there's a series of them you just see like like these spirals of this kind of dark brown ink color just drawn over and over Weird. again and then hobart um mm -hmm. you notice the same thing on the ceiling above one of the upper bunks uh and that would be like jerry murphy's bunk you can see that there's stuff drawn um, just a, just up above him uh, where he just would be laying and looking up spiral just spirals lots and lots of spirals hmm. should we take some pictures or something yes we need to report this back we need to get the captain to okay. get on mother and report this back. We need to get off this rock. We need to get back in that atmosphere. I like the way you talk. 
I like you too, pal. <laughs> At most fear. <laughs> That's delightful. Um, okay. Uh, so is there anything else you're doing in here? Yeah, take some pictures. Did you you said there was a console in here as well? There does seem to be, yeah. All like you this this also has power as well. So you can see the lights are flickering on when you came in. You go over that console. Do yeah, you want me to maybe it. check that out? See if there's maybe something that's on there that wasn't over in the other building? Do it, chat. All right. Okay. Uh, roll a tech. I'm helping. Okay. Uh, what are you looking for? I don't know. Something, basically, whatever's on here, I'm doing a quick scan to see, comparing general files of what's here to the other one and looking for something that looks like it's um isolated to this one that wasn't on the other if that makes sense okay um you can definitely tell that there's not a ton of the topographical and data and stuff that they that they had over in the other places this seems to be more personal files um it definitely looks like there's uh like letters home type of thing that's going mm -hmm. on here um with two successes, uh, I'll give you two things. Uh, one, you do notice that uh, with some of them, uh, there was a... People were, were complaining about um, not feeling well. Mm -hmm. They were feeling a little sickly, um, disoriented. Um, but those don't line up with the names of the people that were drawing the weird things and the people who, who aren't, you know, who look like they scattered their clothes pretty fast. It's like some of the other names. Hmm. Um, you, uh, you do notice some notes from Laura Foster, who is the team lead. Uh, she mentioned that she mentions that apparently there, they came across, um, they came across a, a bio, like a bionational ship landed. Uh, some time ago, you check the dates, compare it to the date that currently is. It looks like this was probably within a few days after you guys went in hypersleep. Uh, and so you guys have been in hypersleep for about 20, 20 days up until earlier today. So likely this was about two to three days after you guys had gone under. And it mentions a, it specifically mentions a, 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 a bio national, uh, camp ship coming down. Interesting. All right. Let's save that or forward it to. Somebody's peed at. Okay. So then, uh, Jaws and Bones, you're heading back to the ship, right? Yes. Okay. So you drive back. Um, and, uh, as you do, both of you make observation tests. Fail. Uh, okay, both of you fail. Uh, you see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do not see that giant hole that opened up in the ground, and you drive right into it. Uh, no, no, you Ignorance just drive back. Is uh, yeah, it's a it's a fairly um, yeah it's a f fairly simple drive back. Uh, when you get back, however, uh, some of the some of the people that are back on the ship. Um, they start talking to you and they say like, we, we just, we're getting the weirdest, we're just getting the weirdest things on radio. Um, yeah, uh, just, uh, we thought it was you. We'd been trying to contact you uh, about it, but uh, it seems to be kind of jamming us a bit. Um, what does it say? I, it, it, it doesn't. It's just sort of, I, I don't know, just, just, just numbers. Can you play it for us? Yeah, yeah. And so he just starts playing it. And it's just, yeah, it's just increasingly growing numbers. And then it resets and then goes up again and then resets. It's a woman's voice. Like a female, like humanistic voice or a more robotic? No, it's a, it's a woman's voice. Okay. Yeah, it sounds fairly frail, um, but yeah. That's resetting. Those numbers mean anything to you? 
Mm, not really. Um, hmm. Maybe we should relay this to Rook. But if you're not able to get a hold of them, I guess we'll have to go back out. Oh. I'll make my own recording so okay. that I've got it locally so that I can play it when we get back. Uh, does it does the signature match anything that I would know? Any sort of navigational coordinates or anything like that? Uh, no, it doesn't sound like coordinates. It doesn't have the same structure that coordinates would. Okay, let's go get your light color thingy that you <laughs> okay. needed. Okay. So you go to the light color thingy room and you pick out the one that looks best, uh, load it back up onto the ATV, uh, and uh, you, you begin heading back. Um, on your way back, uh, you as you're, as you're coming back, you do notice that um, in the, like to the north, when you look off to your left uh, when you're heading back, you can see in the distance, like it's, it's kilometers away, um, you can see what basically looks like a forest. Um, but it's got these awkward shapes, like these curves, right? It's not like directly straight up and down trees, but you can see like a lot of like these winding curves and such. Some of them have like these half C's, almost like parentheses sticking up into the air. Um, and you can see kind of branching off in kind of different directions and such. Uh, but you can see all of that over there. Um, and you see something passing in front of it. And this is a good three, four kilometers away from you. But you can you can kind of see that there's a, a large vehicle that seems to be speeding off away. Uh, like, a, like the size of, um, you know, almost like a garbage truck currently moving yeah you can barely catch it like if you if you didn't have a benevolent gm you definitely wouldn't have seen it at all <laughs> with our two failed <laughs> observation rules um so jaws is gonna kind of turn to bones and just say uh hang on okay <laughs> and i'm taking pictures god i'm gonna speed up and try to go in pursuit okay um roll mobility test i think that's I think that's what driving is. Or just piloting. But they're both agility, so it's whatever. I would prefer mobility. That's fine. Two successes. Okay. Um, get about halfway there, and you realize there's no catching up with this vehicle. They're just way too far in front. Um, they're speeding off to the north somewhere. Um, but you do notice that they they left something behind. Yeah, that's where I want to get to where they started from, okay. at least. So yeah, you see like there's something in the ground that's about 20 feet or so from the edge of what looks like this blackish forest of some kind. Um, we'll get out and okay. take a look at it. So you get out of the ATV, you start moving up, and you notice when you're about 20, 30 paces, you see that there is a person that is um, is kneeling on the ground. You are right over there. They don't seem to. Uh, they don't seem to be responding in any way. Are they? You said they're kneeling. Yeah, they're. They they're just. Literally on their knees. Okay, and then you can see like you their back like their back is to you, but you can see that they're on their knees. They're kind of like sitting at an awkward position, uh, in some way. Um, I'm going to look back to see if Bones got off the cart with me or not. <laughs> no, she's she's pressed against the glass, watching in apprehension. You're, you're holding that light color thingy very uh, safely. Yeah, got to make um, sure the equipment's safe. Uh, pistol drawn, wide berth around this figure. Okay. So that I can see it from the front side. Okay. Um as you start moving around, and you are just a handful of paces away from this kind of force, you hear something coming from within this black, curvy forest. You just hear this, like, very just sort of subtle hum or buzz, perhaps, coming from somewhere inside. Uh, and as you 
rotate around and you look down, you notice immediately that this person isn't wearing a suit. They don't have a helmet on. Their hair is like kind of matted uh, in some way. Um, and you can see that they're kneeling. They're, they're almost like in prayer, if you, if, if you want to think about it in those terms. Mm-hmm. And they're being propped up by what looks like this um, black stick of some kind. Mm, yeah, that's what I was afraid of. And as you, uh, as you continue to get a little bit closer, uh, you can see that that black stick has, they are effectively impaled on it and they are leaning forward, like immobile. You see that there's this kind of blackened coloring to their cheeks. Their shirt has been ripped open and just above where that kind of blackened steak has been pressed against their their midsection you can see that someone has kind of carved this symbol into their chest and it looks like almost like a spiral of some kind uh do do their hands have a knife in it uh no they don't Uh, you can go ahead and take a point of stress for this by the way sure and as uh as you're standing there watching it you hear something else coming from within that forest. You hear the sounds of like a broken stick and then something shuffling around. And I feel like that's a really good place for us to stop for the first week right there. <laughs> Shit. So that Melissa Melissa's can work on her backup die. character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that way we can say, hey, at least everybody survived the first one. Yeah. Yeah. For real. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we tried there. really hard to <laughs> crash early, though. Oh, my gosh. I was going to laugh so hard because all she's got to do is fail the piloting test twice and you guys could literally blow the ship up again. Because <laughs> when you're doing plan of fall, you roll one piloting test. If you're successful, everything's fine. If you fail, you can either abort the planet fall and try again in the new shift, or you can roll again after taking minor component damage and if you fail the second time, then you got to roll major component damage, and that's where you could potentially blow up the ship with a nuclear detonation. So there's that. Okay. I just roll well and everything's fine. Uh, so let's hit uh, those questions. Um, where are they? Okay. Uh, did you participate in the game session? Yeah, all of you get one. Did you risk or sacrifice something to further your personal agenda? uh jen adam we should probably talk more about about the kind of sketching yours i think adam you and i are kind of on the same page now after a chat but janet we never really talked about it but we'll figure out something for that um i think so if you did like it's up to you like it, i would say you guys might kind of make the final call on that um but i think yes for you melissa um but if you're not sure you know i trust everybody so if you're not sure just let me know did you risk your life for your pc buddy did, did, did you all i figure the first session you guys were kind of all figuring out who your pc buddies and rivals were kind of going to be based upon how we're playing that's what it sounds like how many rivals can we have <laughs> <laughs> you could you could be zmajuski it just everyone hates you <laughs> um uh it's up to you you have I mean, as many I as suppose... you like, but I feel like you do have to define one for the XP. I suppose uh, letting my buddy just land haphazardly in a planet we know nothing about is risking my life, right? No. Okay. No. Hmm. no, I'm not going to take that. That's not That's not enough. Uh, make a panic roll. Uh, technically, by taking a stress, you would have... Anytime you take stress, you make a panic roll. Uh, so the only person who actually took stress would have been jaws uh so far uh don't worry that'll change soon um overcome a dangerous event using violent nah uh make a significant discovery or revelation all of you can go ahead and take a point for this uh did you perform an extraordinary action of some kind and landed you... a ship without blowing it up that's not extraordinary <laughs> that's <laughs> <Just> kidding. <laughs> that's your job yeah <laughs> you should have said you should have said like i'll do like loop-de-loops as i'm going down mm. and then i'll draw some messages in the that clouds that was gonna be the and, shuttle uh, ride if everybody um, like was out and was like we're gonna take the shuttle it was gonna be a super fun shuttle ride okay wonderful and then any money no one really earned any money yet okay nah. um but there's that 
Uh, so let's do plugs once more, uh, and then we can get out of here for tonight. So let's just go around one more time, say what you got going on. Uh, so Jeremy. Uh, Poopcast, PLE, WD, fun stuff, invincible episodes, coming soon. Perfect. Uh, Adam. Uh, yeah, I'd like to promote Grim and Perilous Plays. It's our Twitch channel. Um, we're just playing video games on it now, but we'll be playing uh, Borderlands uh, 3 on it tomorrow night with uh, Pixel Prowler. And uh, hopefully soon we'll be playing some role-playing games. Okay, perfect. Uh, I dropped links for all that stuff so you can catch both the Grim and Perilous homepage and your actual Twitch, uh, Twitch TV. Uh, let's see, Jen. Hey everybody, uh, you can catch us tomorrow night. Uh, I will be doing the co-stream with Grim and Perilous Plays on my channel, Pixel Prowler. Perfect. With some of the GMP crew. Uh, and Matt. Yep, you can find Jeff and I tomorrow on Garbly Games. We're playing Masks and Irolithotep at 4.30 Central Standard Time, 9.30 p.m. GMT, and Free League Channel throughout the week. I don't think... I think it's... It can't mm-hmm. be four thirty. It's three thirty. When I've tuned in, it's usually been about three thirty. It's three thirty for me. I'm mount two thirty. Oh, that's us. right. It's not because they haven't done their time change yet. Yes, mm. they do. That that's what's that's, messed me that's up the what's most. messing us They're up. They're still the yes. same time. We've switched out with it. Europe. No, I'm just kidding. You guys are. This <laughs> no, no, I stand by that. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I think there's been like yeah. thirteen states to vote to not to, to go back, or oh, well, goodness. to put forth a vote to not go back. Uh. We don't even do it here. Like we don't get so everybody else changes. And oh, so I'm we, jealous. Uh, we just well, it's actually quite difficult because like, wait, so are our parents ahead of us? Wait, where's my sister again? Crap. What times our stream? Like, because everybody else is changing. We're just doing <laughs> the same. Uh, Chuck. Oh crap! Yeah, Defenders of Cobalt Wednesday, 9 p.m. Central. You can catch Jeff, Jeremy, and I playing some weird frontiers for a rhyme of the Frost Maiden game uh saturday no i'm sorry friday 9 p.m central we got a basic fantasy role-playing game campaign going on uh saturday during the day over on free league publishing uh a lot of us here everyone except for matt and jeremy are going to be playing uh some forbidden lands over on free league publishing that's 1 p.m central and then uh sunday night over on steam steel murder you can catch jeff and i play some shadow run absolutely and yeah. then to add to this wonderful array of content, uh, come back on Friday at uh, 8 Central uh, here on this channel, and we're continuing our Delta Green game. Catch Melissa and I in that. Uh, it's only our second session of a Impossible Landscapes campaign. Uh, and then a week from today uh, on uh, on Monday over on the Free League Publishing channel, uh, you can catch some of us continuing our things from the Flood game. So plenty of options for people. Uh, and so if you want to hang around for a minute, I'm going to go ahead and give uh, Diesel Shot a raid. Looks like they're playing, I guess, D&D, but that's okay. I'm not going to hold that against them. I'm just kidding. I like D&D. It's fine. Just kidding. Ha, 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 ha. So have a good night. <laughs> oh, oh. I do. Ooh. I do like D&D. It's fun. Yeah. I do. It's fun. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch you in a couple weeks and uh, see what Melissa's new character is. So, good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>